Castillo. You may know him from ESPN and the SEC Network, but if you ever get a chance, listen to his terrific radio show, Three Man Front, on 94.5 FM in Birmingham. He is Cole Kubelik. Follow him on Twitter at Cole Kubelik. And, Cole, it's been a while since we've talked, and in during that time, well – Charlie was born. He's two months old. Congratulations. Is the little guy sleeping for you? Well, uh, that, that, that brings up a whole new topic with what's happening in the Kubelik family. Uh, he, uh, his name's Charles Locke, and we're actually right up to call him Locke. So he, um, he is with my wife, and they are about an hour and a half north of me right now. My wife needed ankle surgery a week ago. Well, it was a week ago yesterday. And uh, she had that done at, at Andrew Sports Medicine here in Birmingham. Dr. Walter did a great job. And so she and our one-month-old uh, went to stay with our in-laws. And I am at home with our five-year-old and three-year-old managing them during the week for the next month. So uh, the baby is sleeping a little bit. Uh, from what I'm told, I wouldn't know. Uh, I'm getting <laughs> decent sleep, but uh, also having to deal with three-year-old and the five-year-old by myself every day. So. You know, 2020 just continues to be uh, a complete expletive show uh, in every <laughs> way, shape, form, and fashion. So we're just going to try to go with it. Cole, it sounds like you have your hands full, but as my wife goes to work every day and I handle our six-year-old, I am very curious, Cole, does the three- or five-year-old run your show more? Because there's no way you're running the show. I know that with only yeah, one no, around here. Who's five, running the show? Five-year-old's a girl, three-year-old's a boy, so it's absolutely the five-year-old. Yep. She, all she has to say is daddy, and she pretty much gets it. <laughs> it's, uh, that's about the way it works in this house. And uh, she has obviously figured out how to manipulate that, and at five years old, that's very scary. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, speaking of manipulation, how is Mike Gundy going to manipulate his situation right now? Because this has gone from bad to it's okay to possibly worse in the span of, what, 30, 36 hours. Um, is Mike Gundy in any kind of trouble, in your estimation, of losing his job with the next set of things that have come out of things he said possibly 30 years ago? I think he is. I'm not saying that I believe that he should be, but I think he is uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, just based on where we are uh, in, in our society today and in some of the things that, that uh, that people are making decisions on and some of the reasons that people are making decisions. And you guys know, like I do, in college football, if the power brokers get behind something and they're willing to put up the money to be able to force something to happen, it can happen in a hurry. Now, I, I don't know and I don't believe that that contingent is ready to make that move just yet, but a lot of this will still be determined by what his team thinks of him, uh, maybe people above him and the conversations that they have with players on that football team. And, and I think that's really where the big disconnect comes, in my opinion, in all of this, is that it's not really about freedom of speech and it's not really about what Mike Gundy thinks or likes or does. It's about what his team thinks of what he likes, says, or does. And if that becomes problematic – and his best player on his team and then 10, 15 other players on that team behind him decide not to play or don't want to play or don't want to do something, and that becomes a problem, that's going to force more problems in recruiting down the road. Mike Gundy has to have one thing to be a successful college football coach, good college football players. And if he does something that removes the ability to be able to continuously do that, he's not going to be a college football coach for very long. So these coaches, the, the days of the dictatorship are over. Uh, that's a good thing in a lot of ways. Now, there are, there are some ways that I think that that can be a negative, not necessarily that coaches can't walk around with a dictatorship and no one can say anything and no one can talk to the press and, you know, you have to wear certain clothes and be shaved, your face shaved a certain way, whatever. Some of those things are a little bit ridiculous. And, and then the, the way that some of the players act and respond can be a little bit ridiculous. But – you know, the, the days of coaches just walking around and anything I say goes, it's my way or the highway, those days are over. And, and the main reasons that those days are over are that, you know, options bring leverage. Leverage brings power. Players have power. And, and I'm not one of these guys that you're going to see in the national media that's saying college football players have more power than ever. They could shut the whole system down if they wanted to. That, that's not real. 
because there is a reality that a lot of guys want to play college football, and you're going to be able to find more of them. And a couple of kids saying they're going to sit out or not work out is not going to shut down college football. But those options are what's so different than what they were 10, 15 years ago. The word transfer when I played guys, and it was, I mean, I played 20 years ago, so it was a long time, but in the grand scheme of things, it wasn't that long ago. The word transfer was a death sentence. You were done. You didn't reappear at another Power 5 school and have a successful career and go to the NFL. You ended up at D2 or D3 somewhere, and maybe you played a little bit, and if you were lucky, you got drafted late or signed a free agent deal, and maybe you made a roster at some point in time. That even rarely happened. Uh, so I think I think now that players can transfer, and not only is it accepted, it's welcomed, and guys are still being recruited to do it, and you can do it the next year. Hell, you can do it in your division. I mean, it's, it's not even – I mean, remember two or three years ago, it was blasphemous to think that a guy could transfer within his conference. We got guys transferring within their division now. I mean, an Alabama receiver just signed with Mississippi State and transferred. He's going to play there this year. A I mean, Georgia it's, it's, offensive it's lineman to went to Tennessee. The that are there. Sorry, Cole. A Georgia offensive lineman went to Tennessee. I, I mean, which go. was yeah, unthinkable. I mean, it's, it's, it's happening all over the place. And so, you know, I, I think with those options, players now have a little bit more leverage, and that gives them some power. So I do not think that his job should be in jeopardy if he is correctly communicating now with his team and his team has an understanding of where he stands and where they stand together. But let's be honest, guys, it's college football. And it only takes two or three power brokers to be able to go out and make a move. And if they think that move needs to be made, it's probably going to be. He's Cole Kubelik, ESPN SEC Network, also part of the three-man front, a terrific radio show on 94.5 FM in Birmingham. Follow Cole on Twitter at Cole Kubelik. We had Marvin Wilson, the Florida State defensive lineman, on earlier this week, and he said that to him it's just important to know that the coach cares about us as more than a player, that we are a person to them. That that to him, that's where the relationship has to be. It doesn't have to be more than that, but it, it that's it can't just be what you talked about. The dictatorship, coach, player, you do what I say when I say it. That to him in 2020, we just need to know that the coach actually gives a damn about us. Does that is do you think that that's basically the baseline now? I think that's that's a great starting point, and, and I think some of the things that, that Marvin Wilson has said and done have been spot on, and I think the college football world needs to hear a lot of the things that he has said and he has done. Um, I, I can take you back to position meetings that I had, and a position coach coming in, sitting down, one of the first meetings we had with him, and he basically said, I want you guys to know right now, I'm not your friend. I'm not your teacher. Uh, I want you to make good grades so you can graduate, but so you can be eligible. I don't care about your girlfriend. I don't care about your mommy and your daddy. I don't care about your personal life. I don't care what you do in your free time. Do what I ask you to do. Be ready to play football. And when I coach you, be ready to accept coaching. Other than that, we're good. And I think that's that's what a lot. That's kind of where Marvin Wilson is going. Is that. You know, that, that, that becomes more of that dictatorship that I spoke about a little bit earlier. You know, that there's, there's, there's so much less of a relationship there. And, and listen, coaches don't always need to be players' friends, but I do believe that they need to be their leaders, and, and I do need to believe sometimes they need to be their father figures, and I do believe sometimes they need to be their instructors and not just a guy who is laying down you know, laying down the law on a, on a daily basis and saying my way or the highway, this or that, or you got to go. Because the, the problem has been for such a long time that position coaches especially, coordinators sometimes, and head coaches to an extent, they yield so much power over individuals in college football that you have to put up with a lot of garbage. Uh, the thing, you know, it's one thing that I got frustrated about earlier this offseason, but there were national reporters saying, oh, look at these. They're making them come back for these voluntary workouts. and They're forcing players to come back and be in uncomfortable situations. The thing that people lose sight of, guys, is 99.9% of college football players, you know what they want to be? College football players. No one's making them do anything. Now, do you want to go, go push the sled for an hour after practice? No. 
Do you want to go do inside drill for 15 minutes? Probably not. But you know that's what it takes to be a college football player. Same thing with working out. And guys know that the, the thing that college football players are the most terrified about is falling behind the next guy, which is what all these players have missed more than anything else for the last two or three months is competition. It's not having their strength coach next to them. It's not having the equipment, which is all a big part of it. But that competition inside that facility is what drives you, fuels you. It's what you need more than anything else. So I think the relationship between coaches and players can grow from this, can be different from this. It still needs to be coach-player, but, you know, that whole you show up, do what I say, and then get out of my face and we don't talk anymore, and I'm going to make a ton of money because you play for me, those days are over, and they should be over. But there should also be a very realistic understanding of what it takes to be a player, what it takes to be great. And sometimes that's going to mean you're going to have to accept hard coaching, you're going to have to work hard, and you're going to do things that are going to make you uncomfortable. And there's no doubt, but there's also a respect factor in there that's part of this. And it sounds to me like, Cole, because, you know, I'm 50, David's 54. Uh, You played 20 years ago, you're in your 40s. So, you know, we're all a little older, but not that old. And we grew up where it was a my way or a highway world. How many coaches out there? still think that way because it seems to me that not necessarily just the old coach but the old school coach is in for an incredibly rude awakening and it sounds like if they can't change they're going to be left behind pretty quickly is that accurate i would think so yeah and and i'll I'll tell you something that'll probably tip you off to who is not that guy it's the ones that are great recruiters because recruiting at the end of the day is a relationship business And I've had long conversations with with Jeremy Pruitt about this. And I've told him, I said, man, I don't envy your job. I know you make a ton of money, but good Lord, I can't imagine recruiting some of these kids. He's like, oh, shucks, man. It's just uh, all it is is relationships. You just got to get to know them and relate to them. And I'm just thinking that that seems a lot more difficult than you make it sound. But certain individuals have a knack for it. I think, you know, nobody would view Nick Saban in that way as one of those guys, but I think he is one of those guys. But you can do it in different ways with different personalities. Look at Jeff Collins at Georgia Tech. He's a totally different personality as far as how he does it and what he does and what he wants to be as far as generating those relationships. Look at Mac Brown at North Carolina. I mean, he's older than all of us, but he can still relate to his players. He can still develop relationships. And he can still have those players understand that he actually cares about them as human beings and not just what they're going to be do for him on the football field. I think it's all about not being tone deaf guys. That's all it is. You can have your beliefs. You can think what you want, but just don't be tone deaf to your team and just have an understanding that their emotions and their feelings actually matter because they are human beings. They're not just guys that are coming in your facility putting pads on, playing games, and then going away and you never deal with them anymore. So the guys like Gabo, who want to know more about their team and want to have that personal relationship with their team, you know, those are, those are the ones that are going to flourish in this. And those are the ones that, are, that we're going to see sort of lead the pack in, in the future. But some of those dinosaurs that you mentioned, they're still out there. there. There are a couple of them still out there, and they're either going to change or they're not going to be college football coaches for very much longer. Cole, quickly, what are you hearing in terms of, you know, all 14 SEC schools have announced they're going to have kids on campus by late August with Vandy's announcement earlier this week. Uh, What are you hearing in terms of, A, season starting on time? Will non-conference games happen as scheduled? And also, what are you hearing about fans? I I think the season will start on time. Um, You know, I I do kind of a morning checkup with with a lot of, not just SEC schools, but schools in, in my part of the country, in, in our geographical footprint. And the majority of what I hear is really positive about players coming back, uh, about players getting back to work, about the testing that's taking place. Now, there is there a school or two out there that things are not going well and that we will, mo- we will probably hear in the near future that, that things are a little bit worse than we imagined or that, we have, that we've known? Yeah, I think that, that's, that's possible. That's going to take place. But that's just hopefully going to be a bump in the road as we get close to playing a season and playing college football. Um, I, you know, full season, I think, is, is a big question mark still. And uh, I, I think that fans at full capacity is a big question mark still. I think we will have some fans either way. I don't think we're going to play in front of no fans this year, but I think full capacity is probably still a pretty big question mark. I, I think we start on time. I don't think we have stadiums to capacity. And I think we get – I think, if anything, we move the end of the season up 
and finish it as opposed to delay it and then try to finish it late. That, to me, just seems completely unrealistic. Cole, it's not necessarily football, but on that note, I do know in the North, uh, a good friend of mine's a Michigan State season ticket holder. They've already kind of laid out distancing and there's no tailgating. I can't imagine going to an SEC football game and not tailgating, but is that going to be allowed as far as what you're hearing? I don't know how you... How do you manage that? I don't know. Uh, the, the only way I can imagine, and you know, I mean, I know a lot of these stadiums and how they're set up, and most of them are on campus. You would literally have to block the streets and only allow certain people in a you know two or three block radius around the stadium. And then I still think you're going to get some people in the RV parks and different areas that are going to want to congregate and just be where they're normally at to tailgate, to enjoy the game, and try to create their own atmosphere. That's it's it seems impossible. Uh, you know, I know Notre Dame threw some things down about that. They were they were going to be careful with how they were going to tailgate, when they could tailgate, who could tailgate. So we, we got a long way to go, and obviously a lot of different things are going to have to be discussed as far as what they're allowed to do and how you're allowed to do them. But con- controlling the, the the amount of fans and proximity of fans outside of your stadium seems like one of the more difficult tasks that we don't talk about very often. Cole, good luck with uh, the three and the five year old. Really, and just the, really just the five year old, Cole. The three year old, you know that's easy. Ago. I think, uh, yeah, I think the Little Mermaid we're watching. I think it, uh, it it sort of paused there. The stream got slowed down, so and the dog <laughs> okay. obviously going bananas too. We just, you All know, right. my dog escaped from her baby gate, getting out of the laundry room where we keep it when we leave. Yesterday, we had to try to solve that problem. I mean, we just got, uh, we're just, we are the NCAA tournament right now. It's surviving in advance. We're just, we're just trying to get to the next round. Well, good luck surviving and advancing today. We really appreciate your time. All the best to the family. Thanks for having me, fellas. Cole Kubelik, ESPN, <laughs> SEC Network, uh, 94.5 FM in Birmingham, uh, number one college football market in the country, number one college football station, arguably, in the country. And he is part of a three-man show called Three Man Front on 94.5 FM in Birmingham. It is terrific if you're ever, uh, well, in the neighborhood and or can listen online. Check it out. Cole Kubelik. Follow him on Twitter at Cole Kubelik. Joining us here on Miller and Moulton. That's funny. Three and a five-year-old. It's the NCAA tournament around here. We're just trying to survive in advance. All you got to do is run the pick and roll off the five-year-old. Because if you have a five-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy, we know who's running that household, right? With no with no wife there? Oh, Cole. Good luck, man.